and then all the leaders of the congregation returned to him, and Moses talked with them. Afterward, all the people of Israel came near, and he commanded them all that the Lord had spoken with him in Mount Sinai. And when Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil over his face. Whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would remove the veil until he came out. And when he came out he, and told the people of Israel what he had was commanded, the people of Israel would see the face of Moses, that the skin of the, Moses' face was shining. And Moses would put the veil over his face again until he went in to speak with him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Second Corinthians 3. So we continue to work our way through the book. We begin Advent next week. Yes, I know it's that time. Some of you are already listening to the music and all that's, that's wonderful and fine. We'll probably continue through 2 Corinthians, though, and just, just direct it to why we needed God to become a baby for us. But this morning, we take on what some commentators believe is one of the more complex and debated passages in this book. And so it's my prayer this morning, not so much that we'd understand it thoroughly and completely or resolve all the problems, but that it would be an encouragement to us, even as our brother Tom just prayed. So we're going to begin uh, with verse 7 of, of chapter 3 and continue through the rest of the chapter, and we'll see how far we get this morning. So let's hear God's word to us this morning. Now, if the ministry of death carved in letters on stone, came with such glory that the Israelites could not gaze at Moses' face because of its glory, which was being brought to an end, will not the ministry of the Spirit have even more glory? For if there was glory in the ministry of condemnation, the ministry of righteousness must far exceed it in glory. Indeed, in this case, what once had glory has come to have no glory at all because of the glory that surpasses it. For if what was being brought to an end came with glory, much more will what is permanent have glory. Since we have such a hope, we are very bold. Not like Moses, who had put a veil over his face so that the Israelites might not gaze at the outcome of what was being brought to an end. But their minds were hardened. For to this day, when they read the Old Covenant, that same veil remains unlifted because only through Christ is it taken away. Yes, to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another, for this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Our God and Father, we pray that you would fill us with your glory, the glory that we do not see with our eyes, but that you show us by your Spirit, that we would know that what we have is far greater than our brother Moses and far greater than the Israelites with their temple and worship and priests and majesty. What we have is far greater, even in this room this morning. Would you show us that because of Christ? We pray in his name. Amen. A few weeks ago, I mentioned a little bit of a discussion or debate that I had been having with the Gilbart family when we went to the Virginia Tech soccer games and We've continued that discussion, Uh, and one debate that came up, if you don't know who the Gilbarts are, they are a family in our sister church in Providence and uh, are known to many of us, and one of their son's names is is Quinton, named after the Quinton family, precisely named after them. And Quinton and I have had a running debate about what is the best animal that there is on the planet Earth. And I, of course, present the correct answer, which is dogs. And he is adamant that it is not dogs, but horses. Or as he says in his uppity voice, hosses. He might have a little problem with with the letter R, but the way he says it, it just makes it sound like, you know, he's an equestrian or something, that he ought to, you know, live in Charlottesville or someplace and not this area. And so... Because the debate was not resolved adequately, I sent Quentin a letter. And the letter, which I have here in my hand, 
is very simple. It just says, Dear Quentin, dogs. Sincerely, Pastor Chris. Well, a few days later, this letter was returned to me with an X through what I had written. And on the back, his rebuttal, no hosses. Well, I wasn't going to let that go, so I found some old magazines and cut out every picture of a dog I could find and stuffed it in an envelope and mailed it to him. And I received back from him yet another letter. Here's a drawing of a hoss, and it says, Dear Hosses Hutch, Hosses, I like hosses for hosses' sake, Quentin. And if that wasn't enough, I got a package from him. And in the package, with no letters, no explanation at all, was simply <laughs> this. Well, so far, he has won the letter war. His are better than mine. Now, if someone were to ask me to justify my ministry here at Grace Covenant, you know, I could send letters as well, and I would win that letter war every time because according to Paul, you are God's letters that I could send, and you're great letters at that. I mean, look at verses 1 through 3 when Paul is trying to defend his ministry because some people said that Paul was too weak a leader, he says, do I need letters of recommendation? You yourselves are our letter written on our hearts to be known and read by all, and you show that you are a letter from Christ. So it's not that Paul wrote the letter. Jesus wrote them as his letter, delivered by us, written not with ink, but the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stones, but on tablets of human hearts. And so the point is, the strength of a ministry is not found in numbers or its budget or its building, but in the godliness of its people as they reflect the glory of Christ. So I would be happy to put you all up as evidence of God's grace any day. I would be happy to put a stamp on any of your foreheads and send you off as long as they return you to us as evidence of God's work in here. Because here's the thing, I'm not flattering you. You know it's not because of who you are, but because of God's work in you. You know if left to yourselves, you would be a mess. And yet Paul is here to encourage us that we are more than our sin. We are more than our failings. We're more than our human weaknesses. Jesus himself is turning you into a glorious letter for all the world to see, not because you are strong, but because Christ within you is gracious and mighty. And so Paul's defense to the Corinthians is that they themselves are his defense. They are a product of the gospel, and they are a more glorious defense than they realize. And so that's then why Paul transitions to verse 7. That's the context of this where Paul is saying, you want to make sure I'm, I'm from God? Look at what God has done in your midst, and what he's done is far greater than you can even imagine. So look at verse 7. Here's his argument. Now, if the ministry of death, carved in letters on stone, came with such glory that the Israelites could not gaze at Moses' face, how much more so your glory? Now, what's he talking about here? If he's trying to encourage them, why is he talking about a ministry of death? I mean, what is that? That sounds like something out of a Harry Potter novel or something, the ministry of death. Well, he's talking about the ministry God gave to Moses that was so great that his face shown, this is what Karen read for us earlier, that he came down from the mountain uh, as he delivered the, the Ten Commandments and maybe the whole law of God a second time. His face shone so bright they couldn't even look at him. And you remember who Moses is. He was that great prophet of God that brought God's people out of slavery in Egypt around 1400 BC. And then Paul says his ministry also came in with tablets of stone. That's how God's law was delivered. We think of the Ten Commandments on two tablets, and it might have really been the whole law of God was written on one tablet, one copy for God's people, one copy for God. I don't know if you've seen pictures of the Rosetta Stone that's in the British Museum, but they could cram a lot of writing on one little tablet of stone. And so here is, is the ministry, that the, the promises that God was giving to his people through Moses carved on stone. 
And Paul then compares that old covenant to the gospel which we now have. And he says that's a ministry of death. What we have is better. So here is where we could fall into error. There are at least two mistakes Christians can make as they try to figure out how the Old and New Testaments work together. One is to to kind of combine them too much and say there's really no much difference at all. People in the Reformed world do that sometimes, as if we could just apply the Old Testament to our situation without bringing it through the lens of Christ and, and forget that there's a huge contrast, that God actually became a person, a little baby in a manger, and that changes everything. But then more commonly in our day is the other side, which is to overreact and to take a verse like this and say, everything in the Old Testament is bad and can be ignored. And really, we see the God of love through Jesus. Or some of them even say that the law of God is bad. We're freed from all of those uh, rules. And of course, it's true that the ceremonial law, all those laws of the temple, the civil laws that governed Israel as a nation, of course, those have been fulfilled by Christ. They don't, I mean, look at us. None of us are wearing outfits. None of us, uh, some of you ate pork on, on Thursday, I imagine. Of course, we're freed from those laws. But the moral law of God as summarized by the Ten Commandments is a good and lasting thing. That's why we read, read them earlier. We should all know them. I mean, after all, anything God writes is good. And especially when he writes something that tells us what godliness looks like. And those are summarized by the two great commandments, which are all about love. You want to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength? You want to love your neighbor as yourselves? That looks like the Ten Commandments. Those are good things which ought to be obeyed. So why then, if the law was good, why does Paul call it the ministry of death? Doesn't that sound weird to you? Well, he tells us that in verse 9, and frankly, Andy and Tom have already kind of let us know why. If you look at verse 9, he says, there, if there is glory in the ministry of condemnation. All right, so the old covenant is called, which the old covenant came through Moses at Sinai. He calls it the ministry of death, the ministry of condemnation, the ministry that does not last. Well, why was it condemnation? Because that's all that the law can do to us. It tells us how to live, but it does not give us the power to do so. So if all we did this morning in worship was to read the Ten Commandments over and over again, and all I said was, go follow that and be blessed and filled, amen, over and over and over again. So all you heard was be a good person, straighten up, brush your teeth, uh, take care of everybody around you. How would that make you feel? It ought to make you feel condemned, really, and not encouraged because you can't keep that. If you really know your own heart, then you know you haven't kept the Ten Commandments, not one of them. That's what Jesus tells us on the Sermon on the Mount, unless you're tempted to think maybe there's one you've squeaked by. Oh, no. If you've broken them in your heart, then you've broken them in reality in God's sight. And yet... This is God's perfect standard. This is what we must keep if we are to live. This is what Israel was told. Keep these and you'll be blessed. Break them and you'll be cursed. And that is why they were cursed. And so the the Ten Commandments are wonderful. They are a good thing. And yet they also came with fear. You might remember when God revealed the Ten Commandments, he brought them down with a storm. We read in Exodus 19, that he tells the people not to come up to the mountain that Moses went on, and when it or they would be put to death. Don't come into my presence without a mediator. And then he says, then there, on the third day there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast, so that all the people in the camp trembled. And that's why Moses goes and talks to God for them, and he comes back with such glory that they're scared to look at him. And so the setting of the Ten Commandments is one of fear and God's holiness and death if we come without forgiveness of sins. And so the point is this. The commandments by themselves can only bring death and condemnation. We cannot keep them perfectly. And churches that only preach a moral message are really bringing their people death. Really, that's all they're doing whether they know it or not. And so the good news is this. 
that we have a perfect mediator, not just Moses, but God himself and Jesus Christ becomes our mediator so that he not only pleads to God with us, but he kept those 10 commandments perfectly. He's the only man who ever did. And then having kept them perfectly, he then offers himself up as a perfect sacrifice for our sin so that when God, we, we attach ourselves to him. And when God looks at us, he sees Jesus in our place and he declares us perfect. That's why we, we sang what we did earlier. Let us love and sing and wonder. Let us praise the Savior's name. He has hushed the law's loud thunder. He has quenched Mount Sinai's flame. Or as old theologians have put it, God alone commands and yet God alone fulfills. And when we come with nothing in our hands, then we receive that complete perfection as if we ourselves had fulfilled it. I even wrote a whole book on this. If you want to read more, there's a booklet way back in the, in the hallway you can pick up about, called Hush the Law's Loud Thunders or, some, or Grace My Fear is Relieved. And so that's why those of us in, 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 who grew up maybe in the Bible belts and we've heard all about Jesus all our life, when churches just preach salvation without preaching the law, they're preaching it without power. If they just talk to you about, oh, come and get your sins forgiven, come and trust Jesus, but they haven't showed you how much you've broken the law, it has no power. And that's why we must preach the law of God. We must explain to you, yes, he demands perfection. Do not let yourself off the hook. That little cuss word is bad. That little swerve in traffic that was dangerous is bad. That hatred you felt in your heart at the Thanksgiving dinner because somebody was spouting off about politics stupidly is evil. And that's why we need a savior. And that's why we know how much we are forgiven. The more we see how far we fall short, the more we relish in God's grace to us in Christ, the more we realize how much he did for us. And so the point of this passage is this. Paul is saying Moses' ministry was good and it came with glory, but it, by itself it could only bring death. And so he's arguing from the lesser to the greater. Do you see that? He's saying if the ministry of death made Moses' face shine, don't you realize what you have in your own hearts? Don't you realize what God has done for you? I mean, you know, have you, have, have you ever stared into a light before you're ready, like when you wake up? early in the morning and the sun is bright, or maybe uh, you're in a dark store or a coffee shop and then you walk out and bright, you know, whenever I do that, I sneeze. My brother and I have the same gene. So whenever he and I both walk out at the same time, we both sneeze simultaneously. I don't know if anyone else has that problem. Or maybe you're on a camp out and that Girl Scout, all of a, trying to be tricky, all of a sudden shines a light in your eyes and you can't see anything and so you, you hold up your hand or what if, though, your pupils never adjusted? And have you been to the eye doctor and he put eye drops in your eyes? And it's so bad he had to give you one of those extra pair of sunglasses. Am I the only one that gets, I mean, and you try to drive home and you're like, Lord, please don't let me hit anybody. And you can't see anything. Well, that's what it was like with Moses' face. It was so bright. This ministry of death was so bright they couldn't even look in his face. So what, what is glory? We have to actually... Think about this before we can understand what was going on. And, and honestly, when you think about glory, it's, it's one of those words that it's easier to sense than it is to define, right? I mean, we're coming up on that time of year when some of us will listen to the Messiah. And if, if after the service I tried to explain to you why the Messiah was beautiful by using music theory or whatever, first of all, I would fail because I don't know music theory. But second of all, it just it wouldn't work. It's just better to listen to it. So it is with God's glory. You can try to define it, but it's just you know it when you feel it. Uh, theologians, based on the Hebrew word, think glory means some kind of uh, heaviness or significance. That's why C.S. Lewis has his essay called The Weight of Glory, that you're in the presence of something special that can't be ignored, but it's, it's not a like gloomy heaviness that drags you down. It's, it's one full of light and energy and hope and, and fear. And so that's what Moses' face shone like. And then Paul says this. So there, that's what Israel was in the presence of. And then Paul says this in verse 8. For how much, if that had, will not the ministry of the Spirit have even more glory? 
what we have now, brothers and sisters, what, what you're experiencing this morning, if God is here, is greater than what the Israelites saw in Moses' face. No, it's not visible, but we have it deep in our hearts. Yes, it would be cool if I was able to stand up here or when Tom led us in worship or Karen read the scriptures, if our face shone, right? That would be cool. So bad that you'd all have to put on sunglasses and look like one of those 3D movies. And we could point to the world and say, look, God is real. Come to our church and see the, the light shining that we can't explain. But here's the point. Here's the point. We actually can do that. Even more so. The, the promises of the gospel being proclaimed to you by those who have been saved by God's grace is just like you're looking into the face of somebody whose face is shining even more so. You see, we can do that. We can tell people God is real. Listen to his promises. Listen to what he himself did 2,000 years ago in a manger and then on the road to Jerusalem and then on a cross. Hearing that and believing that is far more glorious than mere, any miracles I could do up front here that you could see. And this way, no one has to shield their eyes when they approach God because Christ has made the way. This way, there's nothing to fear, but we boldly enter into his presence. We've confessed our sins. We've repented of them. They're forgiven. And so we don't have to worry about God smiting us down anymore, you see. This is better. This is more glorious because it's the way of mercy, which is offered to anyone who believes. Christ has hushed the law's loud thunder, and all that remains for those of us in Christ is his grace, his help, his comfort, and so we do not fear death for us or for our loved ones that are in Christ. Because look at what Paul calls it next. He says, if there is glory in the ministry of condemnation, verse 9, the ministry of righteousness must far exceed it in glory. Not our righteousness, the righteousness of Jesus given to us that we've already talked about. And it's ours. And if we have Jesus' righteousness, death has no claim on us. We will live forever. Jesus has told us, if you've believed, you've already entered in from death into life. And you will not face judgment. John chapter 5. So look, what, what would you rather have? I want you to really think about this. Because our culture is all messed up about this. Would you rather have an experience on a Sunday morning or maybe a Friday night at a retreat or whatever where you could go and see somebody's face shine or maybe the singing was super awesome and you just got this emotional? Would you rather have that and then walk away and it's gone? Or would you rather have the promise of the gospel forever that you can get in any simple church like ours where they just tell you about the love of Jesus, your own sin, but that your sin's forgiven? That lasts forever. You see, a lot of churches don't get this. A lot of churches downplay how good the gospel is, how glorious the gospel is, and they recreate the need for visual, uh, whether they put on special performances on Sunday morning because they think it's not, everything's boring without it, or whether they make up miracles that are happening, and I will be blunt about that. They do. I just saw a, a video of a church that says they have a glory cloud that shows up uh, sometimes. But all it is is it's a dark sanctuary with a lot of bright sh spotlights and there's some cool dust, all right? And they say that, and even if that was a miracle, it's still not as great as the gospel of Jesus Christ freely given to all who would believe. That's what Paul's saying. You want to know whether God's at work, Corinthians? Look at you. Look at what God is doing in you. I mean, I felt this way last week, honestly, after Sunday. Um, after Andy's preaching uh, powerfully about God's goodness to us and then hearing all y'all's testimonies about what God's been doing in your life. And then afterwards, as I'm leaving, seeing Chris North leading a group of visitors up here in prayer for one another. That's the glory of God, my friends. That filled my heart with more joy than if one of your face started shining, right? And I didn't have to reach for any sunglasses. That's the point. So here's your choice. You could have one guy shine brightly like Moses where you're still, he's the one who's talked to God and you're kind of scared of him. Or you can know that the veil is gone 
and you can go freely, all of us, free access to your heavenly Father because of Christ. Do you see how that's more glorious than what Moses brought? What Moses brought was wonderful and good, but what we have is so much greater. This is one reason why Paul then says, look, verse 10 and 11 briefly, he says, look, this glory is This glory's past. It's come and gone. And if it's come and gone, verse 11, how much more is our glory which is permanent? Now, a couple things are going on here. Some commentators think that when, based on verse uh, 13, I think, that when Moses went and talked to God, his face would shine brightly, but then over time it would fade until he went and talked to God again. So he wore a veil to kind of hide that. I don't think that's, that's right, but it's possible, I guess. I think Paul's talking eschatologically here. Big word just to impress you. I think he's talking about the fact that Israel's glory is now gone. It's now passed into the church. And Israel, when you think about it, was plenty glorious. It had the temple with God's real presence. It had Jerusalem with all its beauty and buildings. It had an army when it was needed. It had kings and prophets and priests. But that's all gone. And what we have is far better You know, again, this is something that American Christians and a lot of Christians around the world have a hard time grasping, and I kind of get that. I grew up reading some comic book versions of the Bible. And honestly, the comic books, think about this. If any of you have like seen movies or comic, the comic books about the Old Testament are just way cooler than the New Testament. I mean, once you get past Jesus' resurrection. Because in the Old Testament, you've got, you know, you've got armies and battles and floods and, and pestilence and all that cool stuff. In the New Testament, what do you got? You got a bunch of Christians meeting in a room, praying, sometimes flames of fire, but usually not, going from city to city. It just doesn't, Hollywood, it's just nothing for Hollywood to do with that. But that's the whole point of the New Testament, to explain to us that's greater. Because now we have a kingdom without borders. Now we have a kingdom without armies. Now we conquer the world through mercy and love. And anyone, anywhere can come to Christ and gather together in his name and love one another and take care of one another and grow in holiness. And that's far greater than if you commanded an army. Do you get that? Again, though, it's hard to grasp that. And that's why Christians today, many of them, uh, think that Israel continues with all of its glory and they get obsessed with the politics of the Middle East and it's easier to measure that way. But this passage and so many like it tell us that's not what God is doing in our day. Because what we have, this kingdom is permanent. Not grace covenant, of course, not our denomination. That's not what he's talking about. It's the kingdom of Christ, the church, which is permanent, a church across many denominations and labels. It's everyone who has heard the gospel and trusted Christ, been baptized into his name. That is permanent. And so we no longer... As I think from verse 10 and 11, we no longer find our primary identity in your country or in your racial heritage or in a denomination. Yes, be loyal to all of those. Learn from them. Uh, Be happy about them in a moderate way. But your primary identity is being connected to God himself through his son and being united to people across the world from every tribe, people, language, and tongue. That is what's permanent. That's the glory of the gospel. That's the glory of the church. And so we have to move on just as we have time, just to a couple of practical applications from this. Uh, Verse 12 and 13, Paul then says, this is why I've been writing this. Because we have such hope, we, we who you think are weak, we are actually very bold. Not like, see, not like Moses who put a veil over his face to, I think, to protect God's people from the wrath of God, if you will, or the image of God's wrath. But now there's no veil. Now look, if you are look, if you are in Christ, you have nothing to fear from me or anybody. Christ has your back. Your worst enemy is your own sin, and that's been taken care of. Then your next worst enemy is death, and Christ has conquered death. And so therefore, I can just come to you without veil, with all my messes and my weaknesses, my own doubts, and some of yours too, and just say, Believe in Jesus. It's going to be okay. You see, that makes us bold. It can make you bold, too, at the workplace. 
when you run across a, a colleague who's in trouble and is hurting and you, you sense a crack there that maybe they're ready to hear about the mercy of God, maybe they'll believe, maybe they won't, but you can offer them good news. You don't say to them, all right, I see you're in trouble. I've got 11 steps to fix your life. Would you come to my Tupperware dinner or whatever? Okay, I'm making stuff up. But you can boldly offer them total and free forgiveness in Christ right there and then if they turn from their sins and trust him. And maybe it's going to take steps. That's not the point. I'm not trying to get you to force them. But you can be bold with the mercy of God. There's nothing that would keep them from God their Father if they would but believe. So here's the thing, though, as Paul goes on. Look at verse 14. He says, but their minds were hardened. For even to this day, the, the Jews, when they read the Old Covenant, so again, that's probably Exodus through Deuteronomy, when they read that, the same veil remains unlifted because only through Christ is it taken away. So he's talking about the Jews of his day. He's now mixing metaphors a little bit. He's taking the veil away from Moses' face. He's putting it in front of their hearts. But it's what it symbolizes, what matters. And so Paul, who was a, a Jew, obviously, he had met Jesus. And once he met Jesus, he then began to see how the old, old Testament was about Christ. Even like the disciples on the road to Emmaus, everything pointed to God's mercy in the coming Savior. Remember, the Jews of the Old Testament, those that were saved, were saved by grace. They were saved by believing in God's promises, not by keeping the law. And yet, the Jews of Paul's day, those that did not believe in Christ, are still under the curse of the law. They're, they read the same scriptures, but all they hear is the things they must do. And so they're either trying to still get a, earn, their, earn God's favor, or they just straight out rebel because they know they can't, right? And that's what, again, when all you're done is presented with the law of God, those are your two choices. Try to justify yourself or just say, forget it, I'm just leaving it. And so there's a veil that remains in their heart. And so just a couple points from this. First of all, this applies still to Jewish friends of our day. Again, there are many Christians that don't want to try to present Jesus to the Jews. They think God's got his own promises with them. Those are still in maintenance. And so they're saved in their own way. And really, it's again, it's all about, I think, just supporting Israel. And frankly, evangelism gets in the way of that political cause. And so they're afraid to, say the, to give them the gospel. Paul says clearly that the veil is only taken away by Christ. They can be saved by grace just as we are, but they must hear about Jesus and trust in him as the promised Messiah. But also, this is true overall. I just mentioned about trying to present the gospel to a friend at work. But here's the point. You can't take that veil away. You can tell them about Jesus. You can live a good example yourself of somebody who has a hope within you. But only God can save them. Only God can open their eyes. And so you're praying the whole time. You're saying a few stumbling words, but you're saying them with prayer, asking the Holy Spirit to move, and God can. Because that's the good news. Look at verse, where is this? Verse 14, or so verse 15. Okay, that whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over his eyes, but verse 16. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. You see, that's all it takes. For anyone who hears the gospel, all they have to do is surrender their pride, turn to God, say, I need you. I don't understand you very much, but I know you've forgiven my, your, my sins through your son. As soon as they do that, their eyes are opened. The spirit pours into their life. They are justified and freed forever. It's really kind of what Andy said last week. It's the difference between hearing that honey is a sweet thing and a good thing and the difference between tasting it. And so now they taste the goodness of God, and that's something the Spirit does for them. And so that's why we don't force decisions upon people. I mean, I know we try, especially with our kids. We kind of like try to pry open their mouth 
and bring the honey all the way in just till it drops. We can't do that. We show them how good the honey is. We show them that we love it. But it's the spirit that must make them taste the gospel. And then all of that then turns to verse 17, where Paul says, The Lord is the spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. This is one of those great memory verses that can be taken out of context and applied more to civic liberty and so forth. But what's the context? Freedom from what, do you think? Well, what he said earlier, freedom from the condemnation of the law, freedom from liberty. It was interesting as Paul, uh, as Tom read the pardon of sin earlier from Acts 13. He said, by this gospel, we are freed from everything we could not be freed from by the law of Moses. Did you hear that? But in the bulletin, it's the other translation, and both are, are perfectly legitimate, which is to be justified. That's the, it's almost the same word. If you are justified, if you're declared just, that means now you're free. You're free in Christ. The law can't condemn you. You know you can't keep it. And so now you're just, you, yes, you try, but now you're free just to serve Christ. Is, is he able? No, and you're going to stumble and fall along the way. I mean, think about it this morning. Let's go back to the Ten Commandments and said, all right, we're really going to work hard on making sure you follow the Ten Commandments. So next week, we're going to do a survey before you come into worship. If you followed all Ten Commandments, you get to sit in the front row. And a bunch of you don't want to sit in the front row, so you're going to break at least one. And then we go back and maybe break two or three commandments, second couple of rows, maybe four or five towards the back. If you've broken eight or seven or eight, then you have to be in the foyer. I'm sorry. Again, some of you are like, I like the coffee back there. I'll... And if you've broken all of them, you get to be in the parking lot. Then we'd be under a burden. We wouldn't be freed from the obligations of the law in that sense. But once we realize that honestly, we've broken them all, and Jesus has fulfilled them all, and he loves us anyway, then we're just free to live life as best we can and serve him. Yes, growing in the, our obedience as he gives us the ability. That's what Paul is saying. We have freedom in the gospel to no longer fear being condemned. And then that leads to verse 18. Here's our vision. Here's what sums it all up. And we all, with unveiled face, behold the glory of the Lord, and you are. So you're, you have free access to God, but he doesn't leave you the same. Because you have that free access, we're not changed. I forget who said that earlier. We are then being transformed into the image from glory to glory. What is the image? It's the image of our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm convinced that's what Paul means here from Romans 8. You want to know what it looks to, to be a godly person. You want to know what it looks like to look like God, then look at Jesus. And as the Spirit works in your life, you are becoming more like Jesus. Oh, you may not feel like it, but you are. He is transforming you from glory to glory to glory. Oh, your face doesn't shine. You can't see it visibly. But it's happening in little ways. It's not a matter of outward success or glitter or money. But it looks like Jesus upon the cross. There it is most broken, an impoverished moment, but there in his greatest glory. It happens, this transformation. Each day when you face something you, you can't handle and it makes you pray. It happens each Lord's Day when you come and you believe the gospel again and give God all the glory for saving you. It happens each time when you hear about a need and you decide to quietly meet it without anyone else knowing. I just heard about a couple this week. And I won't say their names, but they, they heard about this the, the church in California that lost all their, their houses. And so instead of exchanging physical gifts with relatives, they're exchanging donations to this needy church in Paradise, California. See, no one knows about that except me. These are the things. Nobody sees these things when you do them. Nobody knows you're praying for others. Nobody knows when you're thinking loving thoughts and, and wishing well for others. And your face doesn't literally begin to glow, except it kind of does. It glows with the joy of the Lord. It develops the good kind of wrinkles. 
the wrinkles that come from laughter and from peace and from kindness. You begin to look more like Christ while remaining just who you are. It's because you're becoming a letter. You are a letter from Jesus to this world. And you're a letter that's becoming more glorious somehow, day by day. I told you Paul likes to mix his metaphors. You know, I have another letter also, a little more serious than the ones I sent to Quentin. And this one is addressed to all of y'all, which is why I'm reading it. And it's from your former pastor, our former pastor, Gordon Willard. And he says, my dearest friends at GCPC, I'm coming close to the conclusion of my work with Mission to the World and to my overall career as a pastor. I often praise God for letting me have a 25-year relationship with your beloved congregation. I can't think of any other church I would rather know than GCPC. You have lovingly supported me both as pastor and as missionary. I look forward to your support simply now as old friend. I trust that the Lord will give us time for more leisurely visits warmly in Christ, Gordon. You see, Gordon wrote us a letter to tell you all that you are a letter, a letter of God's grace to him and to this world. Be encouraged. Whatever you're going through, you are being transformed by the Spirit of God from glory to glory. Let's now remember that, exult in it, and let that glory, the real kind of glory, flow through us. Let's pray. God and Father, we admit that we would long to see the visible. We'd love to measure what you are doing with